Hey, it's John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and it's The Entrepreneurial You, the show for dedicated and passionate Caribbean entrepreneurs seeking daily inspiration, brought to you by author, speaker, and award-winning entrepreneur, Henneke Watkins-Porter. You must be prepared to ignite. The business is a cause, and the cause supports the business. It's a circle. And so what I mean by that is when I started the company, I knew that I wanted to directly engage with farmers. I wanted to meet them. I wanted to be in their homes. I wanted to get to know them. And I've done that for 15 years. This next time I travel, uh, whenever that'll be um, after a vaccine, then it'll be my 40. It'll be my 45th origin trip since I started to meet with farmers. And that's a lot of travel. And so then when I became you know, engaged with them and understood uh, what was happening in their communities, it was a very natural step for us to say, not can we fix this? This is a very important notion. Not can we come in as the great white savior and solve all your problems. But the question is, can we be your partner? Can we be your friend? And is there a way for us to together contribute to some of these issues in your village? And so that's the way it started. And the school lunch program started about 12 years ago in the Philippines and then to Tanzania. We're still doing it. And as you mentioned in the intro, over a million meals. And it's all supported by the PTAs of these little jungle schools. Hi. This is Henneko. I'm so glad you took the time to stop by today. In Jamaican parlance, wagwan. Me glad to say a dial. This episode is sponsored by HennekeWatkinsPorter.com as well as the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Now on HennekeWatkinsPorter.com, you can visit us for blogs, resources, books, online podcast courses, podcasts, and more. If you are new to the Entrepreneurial New Podcast, be sure to check out past episodes with guests such as John Lee Dumas, Patrice Washington, Seth Godin, Richard Branson, Amy Porterfield, and a host of other game changers. We needed to raise capital, but our experience with local financial institutions was that they were cautious and slow to act, and interest rates were far too high. We had real concerns about financing our business through outside equity investors and the possibility of interference. Could we get a fair valuation for our business? We had our own ideas about the business and its value. Should I go the traditional route of bank financing or should I try the Jamaica Stock Exchange? So we made a call and experienced transformation of our business through conversations. I'm John Mafood, CEO of Jamaican Teas, and we're listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Give us a call today at 876-967-3271 to begin your transformation through conversation. We want to see your company listed on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And now, here's today's episode. Men love to wonder, and that is a seed of science. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Greetings, my peak performer. It is episode 171 of the Entrepreneurial You podcast. I'm Henneke Watkins Porter. Today's episode is with Sean Askinosi, and Sean left a successful career as a criminal defense lawyer in 2006 to start a bean to bar chocolate factory, and he never looked back. His company, Askinosi Chocolate, was recently named by Forbes one of the 25 best small companies in America. So far, the company has provided over a million school lunches to malnourished children in Tanzania and the Philippines without any donations. That's very impressive. Founded at the forefront of the American craft chocolate revolution and regarded by many as a vanguard in the industry, Sean was named by O, the Oprah magazine, one of 15 guys who are saving the world. And his book, uh, which we allow him to talk about um, in a little bit, is an Amazon bestseller. Welcome, Sean, as we talk about the sweet treat of running a chocolate business. Thank you, Henneke. Glad to be with you. Absolutely. So um, before I go into all of, you know, what we're going to be talking about, uh, do you have any connections to Jamaica? No, I wish I did. <laughs> what do you know about Jamaica, if anything? Uh, you know, of course, I know that there is a, a burgeoning chocolate business in Jamaica. I know that cocoa is grown in Jamaica. And uh, of course, so I've studied it from that standpoint, um, you know, for 10 or 15 years. 
And uh, I know that uh, really nice Trinitario cocoa beans are grown in Jamaica. Mm, awesome. Well, that's good. That's good knowledge. All right. So let's talk about running a chocolate business. Tell us a little into your background. I mean, I did mention that you left your, your good job, your good career as a defense lawyer, but just a little in your background and, and, and how you um, went into business. Yes. So my experience was uh, I specialized in criminal law and I subspecialized in very serious felony cases, murder, robbery, drug cases, uh, uh, cases that carried the death penalty. And I spent a lot of time in the courtroom over 20 years. And I just reached a point wherein I'm sure many of your listeners can uh, relate, but I just couldn't do it anymore. I loved it. I was called to it. I, I was good at it. I never lost a jury trial in 20 years. And um, but then, you know, I just I could tell it was over and it was time for me, um, at least according to what I was feeling in my mind and body, that it was time to go. And then I spent about five years still practicing law, but searching for the next calling and the next sort of vocation in my life. And I really struggled with that. Like I said, it took five years, but I eventually settled on chocolate and started traveling around the world to meet cocoa farmers. And I quit my law job and here we are. Hmm, interesting. And so how, what was the start like for you um, during the early days? You mean other than my wife threatening <laughs> to leave me? <laughs> yeah, other than that? <laughs> other than that. No. Hey, just last weekend, we celebrated 33 years of uh, marriage. So she she didn't leave me, thank the Lord. Um, <laughs> but uh you know, it was tough because as a lawyer, the only thing I really knew how to do is maybe fix a jam in the copier and change the toner in the printer or something. But this is this is a very technical process. I had zero science classes in college. And uh, also, I should mention, I had zero accounting and business classes. And so um, I really had no business. Um, but this is the way it goes, right? When we feel um, as though we're called to something and we can do it. It gives us the uh, courage um, and maybe the spirit to take a step forward. And so that's what I did. And, and um, you know, I'd saved up some money from my law career and I put it all in, everything. And uh, it's been good. We're a very small business, though, a family business with only uh, 17 full-time employees. So we're, we're tiny. Mm -hmm. And so what's your why? Why, you know, why, why do you keep at this? Well, I think the reason that I keep at it is because this business um, has afforded me um, what I describe in the book as reverse scale. And what I mean by that is I don't delegate a lot of things because we're so small. And in the non-delegation, it gives me an opportunity to continually have the chance to have an encounter with the divine, shall we say. So mm -hmm. in other words... Um, around the world and in my travels and just meeting with farmers, I've had the chance to, um, in many ways, see the veil lifted um, and see God, if I can say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's why I do it. Absolutely. Do it. Absolutely. And talking about, you know, see, you know, being able to see God, you know, and I'm a firm believer, I'm a woman of faith as well. So you also have a um a cause aligned to your business which you're you're providing school lunches um to malnourished children in Tanzania and the Philippines tell us about that and and you know why is it important for you to give back out of your business why do you feel the need to do that well thanks for asking about that and you know interestingly for us we do the business is a cause and the cause supports the business. It's a circle. And so what I mean by that is when I started the company, I knew that I wanted to directly engage with farmers. I wanted to meet them. I wanted to be in their homes. I wanted to get to know them. And I've done that for 15 years. This next time I travel, uh, whenever that'll be um, mm -hmm. after a vaccine, then mm -hmm. it'll be my 40. It'll be my 45th origin trip. Um, since I started to meet with farmers and that's a lot of travel. And so then when I became you know, engaged with them and understood uh, what was happening in their communities, it was a very natural step for us to say, not can we fix this? This is a very important notion. Not can we come in as the great white savior and solve all your problems. But the question is, can we be your partner? 
Can we be your friend? And is there a way for us to together contribute to some of these issues in your village? And so that's the way it started. And the school lunch program started about 12 years ago in the Philippines and then to Tanzania. We're still doing it. And as you mentioned in the intro, over a million meals. And it's all supported by the PTAs of these little jungle schools getting together and making a product that we sell um, and then all of the money from the sales go, uh, fund these school lunch programs where we monitor the height and weight and attendance of school attendance of the children. And we're even doing it now in the midst of this pandemic in, in the Philippines. Uh, the teachers are delivering meals to these kids. The other thing that we do is something called Chocolate University. And I'm in a a uh, sort of uh, um, an area that's being rehabilitated in my community. There's a lot of poverty near my in my neighborhood. And so from the beginning, I wanted to engage the children uh, both in elementary and middle school and high school to inspire them that small business can be a force for good in the world and that there's a world beyond Springfield, Missouri, which is my hometown. And so uh, it all kind of culminates in this high school program where it's a business immersion program the local high school students that we select, uh, they spend time in a nearby university learning about our business for about a week. They learn about Tanzania language and culture. They go home and pack, meet me at the airport, and we go to Tanzania for them to meet cocoa farmers. And it's a transformative experience for them. And um, this is a very, very important part of our business. So like I said, yes, it's a cause, but it's so wrapped up in who we are as a company that uh, it's not charity, it's not philanthropy, it's it's just part of our business. Absolutely. And I'm sure with running a business of your nature, there are lots of ups and downs that you've encountered, you know, since you've begun. Now, if you will, um, before you go into some of the, the, the high points on this journey for you, just share some of the um, challenges that you've had and how you overcame those. Well, okay, let's talk about right now. So in the midst of this pandemic, uh, my little chocolate factory is still making chocolate. But what I needed to do with the nine or 10 people who are in the production side, you know, roasting the cocoa beans and making the chocolate, I separated them into two groups. One is Monday through Thursday. The other is Friday through Sunday. They don't overlap in shifts. And what that means is that we're making approximately 30% less chocolate. Well, that means less sales. And so that has been a big challenge for us to operate, you know, within that um, band so that we can have the cash flow to support um, keeping those employees paid and hired. And, you know, so this is what we do. We operate and, and this challenge is really an opportunity for us. So I've turned this into an opportunity and you're like, well, how could that be if you're making less chocolate? Well, what we're trying to do is become more efficient in the way that we sell it. That is, we're trying to sell chocolate that would give us a better profit margin and not lose too much money, all the while making less chocolate. That that's a challenge, you know, for us right now in the midst of this pandemic. And I don't see it I don't see that that I've just described to you changing anytime in the near future. It'll be this way for a while. Mm, whoa. All right, so let's talk about some of your wins. Hmm. Well, the first win that I would say is what we've already talked about. Right. If, if, I, had, of if that. I have a chance, <laughs> yes. If I have a chance to go, let's say, be in a village in Tanzania and the farmers uh, there that I know have known for years tell me that when I get old, you know, someday, like really old, like go to a nursing home, that they don't want me to go to a nursing home. They want me to come live with them. They want me to live in the village so they can take care of me. That that's a high. That's a that's a success. When I have a, a, a young person, a student who had lived in the nearby homeless shelter, you know, talk about the way that we treated her, she and her brother when they came for chocolate samples in our factory, that we treated them as a human being and not, you know, as somebody pulling up in a Mercedes to buy a bunch of chocolate. You know, that's a success story to me. And so really the successful stories that I tell are not about money. They're not about profit. Um, they're about um the opportunity for me as a human being to change my own heart, for me to learn and to be a student and to experience transformation day by day. We know that transformation, just like uh, salvation, uh, it's not a one-time 
um, static experience, right? It's something we work out. It's part of our unfolding um, as Christians and as human beings. And so those are the, those are the highs for me. Mm -hmm. You talk about as Christians, what has been your experience being a business owner um, vis-a-vis your faith? So that's a great question. And for me, um, it's a it's um, an integral part of my faith. I'm a family brother at uh, a nearby Trappist monastery, which is Catholic. I'm not Catholic, but um, and I've done that and been related to that monastery for 20 years. And so what that means is, is that I live by something called a rule of life. And I write about that in the final chapter of my book. And what this means is, uh, for example, this morning, um, when I woke up, I, I have a practice of the morning, which includes meditation and prayer. And uh, I've done this for a very long time. And so I begin my day with, for example, intercessory prayer, praying for people in my life who maybe are sick or suffering. And that is a way for me to begin my day. So it's really it's infused throughout the day. So, for example, when I um, make a business decision or whether it's about cocoa beans or about cash flow, I don't have to stop and think, well, what would Jesus do? Or I I don't need to stop and think about that because I I have a, a practice of infusing it in such a way that it's just part of me. Um, Now, you know, I'm 59 years old. This has been a way of life for me. So what I would say in short, uh, and even though I've taken a long time to answer your question, what I would say is, is that I don't talk about it as much as I try to let my actions speak um, more loudly about um, who I am as a person and let that um, light be uh, a reflection of Christ in me. Absolutely. And that makes sense. Now, you did mention a little bit about your book. So let's get to that question. It's entitled, you know, Meaningful Work, The Quest to Do Great Business, Find Your Calling and Feed Your Soul, which you co-wrote with your daughter. Um, What inspired the book and what was the journey like writing it with your daughter? The journey with my daughter was outstanding. I mean, it was, uh, she works with me in the business and is a co-owner with me in the business. And we're both very um, headstrong people. Um, She's a really gifted writer. And so she edited pretty much the entire thing. We had experiences where we would argue about things and, but it was great. And it was really one of the highlights of my life. Um, As I look back Uh, It was a a three-year project that required a lot of our time while we were running our business. You know, I got to know a lot more about her and and likewise um, her knowing more about me and my story. But I think the real challenge of the book and uh, what took so long is because it's not very hard to write a book uh, and you know this, um, (laughs) that is uh, one, it's, it's not hard to write a book, a book uh, that let's call it the hero story. Like, look how great I am. Look at all these things that I've done. Um, that that's easy. That's a glorified resume. What's more challenging is to write a book in which you weave parts of your own story in such a way that other people see themselves, and that other people can can connect and relate and say, oh, you know, I've I, I've experienced that kind of sorrow and sadness in my life. I I understand you know, what they're talking about. And I see how that can apply in my life. That takes time. And really, I would say also, too, that would be the inspiration of the book. For many years, I didn't really think I had a book in me. You know, I was busy and and uh, I, I wasn't sure that really people would be very interested. But then as time has passed with this business that we're running, I felt like some of the things that we um, express and the way that we run our business could uh, provide some lessons for others who are starting in their own entrepreneurial path and would like to see at least one way that it can be done that, you know, we can engage with our communities in our neighborhood. We can find ways toward social justice. Yes, we might make a little bit less money. At least that's my experience, but it's worth it because of all of the things that we've been talking about. And so a little summary of what the book really is about. The summary of the book is one way in a path toward finding meaningful work in the place where you are right now and how you begin that work and it's not easy and how you might connect and find your calling. That's what it's about. Perhaps you want to share some insight into how you may do that, how you may find your calling. If I could ask um, 
entrepreneurs or people who are searching and searching and struggling for the um, the path forward because they just don't see it, is I would ask them, where does it hurt? Where are you suffering? Where is your pain? Where is your broken heart? And And that may sound very paradoxical. My answer to that is, um, Gandhi said, if you want to find yourself, lose yourself in the service of others. Christ said something very similar to that. And so the point is that what we need to do in order to receive the message is this counterintuitive notion of serving someone else who needs us. So in answer to you, I would say the way, one way to do this is to put down the books, stop Googling. Uh, the answer to this question, and instead roll up your sleeves, look around you, see who needs you, and begin serving them without the expectation of anything in return. And this is the mystery. All right. So as we talk about the sweet treats of running a chocolate business, and yours has been very sweet, of course, and you know, you're actually also treating others outside of your business and your your jurisdiction. Uh, What one piece of advice would you give to somebody, particularly who wants to consider starting a chocolate business um, to that? What one piece of advice would you give? I think the one piece of advice, and this is going to sound really boring, and that is try to understand where your weaknesses are. Maybe, for, for example, for me, it was in accounting and manufacturing. And so I tried to find people who would be willing to help me and willing to talk to me. And in some cases, I would pay them. And so I think recognizing your weaknesses and recognizing where you need help and then not being so overly confident that you can't find humility within yourself to ask for help. That's what I say. And so looking back, um, what lesson have you learned that, you know, you can take from from your journey and share it with, with, with others who are listening? I recently um, listened to one of my teachers in the monastic faith say, um, even in times of trouble, I will not break the faith of my awakened heart. So right now, our country and our world is in the midst of serious struggle and serious difficulties. And I think that as individuals, we have to remind ourselves that even in the struggle, even in the pain, even in the suffering, that we won't break the faith of our awakened hearts. We won't give up. That's the thing that I would say that I have learned and it's carried me through all these years. All entrepreneurs can attest to that. Never, ever, ever give up. It's so important to stick to your journey. Um, so important to, you know, continue even when the going gets tough, you know, and we're, as you say, mm-hmm. we're living in some really tough times right now. If there's anything you'd like to share about the business that I haven't yet asked you and your, your journey, please go ahead and share with our Well, I think we've covered so many things, and uh, I just would encourage people to not um, lose faith and not lose heart, Um, and especially during the time when you think, I'm called to something else, I just don't know what it is. And sometimes that itself can be such a struggle. And um, poet philosopher John O'Donohue describes this as a threshold. And I think just, you know, the willingness to surrender in a threshold, not not giving up, not not be, not giving up as we traditionally think of it, but surrender to the experience that's happening right now, recognizing that there will be light. We will see it. Um, And the threshold sometimes has very important lessons to teach us, like right now. We are in a threshold, collectively, um, and so we have a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. Surrender to the process. I like it. I like it. Um, I'm going to ask you to perhaps share uh, your information, your contact information, so that our community can be in touch with you. Sure. Well, of course, our website um, is askinosi.com, A-S-K-I-N-O-S-I-E. And there's a lot of information on that website. I have a little blog at seanaskinosi.com. And the way to reach me is hello at seanaskinosi.com. And I love hearing from people and, and engaging in conversation. Thank you so much, Sean Askinosi. It's been my pleasure speaking with you. And thank you to my performers for tuning in to this episode with Sean Askinosi. I really look forward to connecting with you next week. In the meantime, of course, you know you can get my my podcast power on Kindle, that version as that was recently released, among other things, podcast power, the quick start guide to launching and leveling up your brand. Point of hope, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. Ephesians 2 verse 8. What good?